I'm Kevin Ames. I'm a commercial photographer, and I started back in the day when uh, we used to capture images on the stuff that we wake up today on our teeth before we brush them, film. And we're going to be doing uh, composition today, both in camera and in post-production. And this is really important because working in post-production is not fixing things. There's a great t-shirt down at NAB that says, uh, we'll fix it in post and it's scratched out and they say on set. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And in this session, we've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to talk about compositional rules and more importantly, how to break them. We, can't, we, we need to know what the rules are so that we can be intentional about what we do. Framing for visual impact. Uh, these are all correlated and tied into each other. Using light to focus attention. Reframing subjects in post-production. We've got tools now that let us do things we couldn't do before. For instance, if we've shot something too tight, we can now add background to it seamlessly and uh, get away with it, which we were never able to do until actually artificial intelligence started playing a part. I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about cinematic composition because we're doing more and more video. How many people in here are strictly still photographers? Okay, cool, all right. Uh, strictly video photographers. Okay, we got three, so a third of our, okay, all right, almost half the audience. And how about both? All right, good. So it's really important that we understand composition when it's coming to, to storytelling, no matter what our media is. Now, since I'm a still guy, that doesn't mean that I haven't shot video and I haven't been involved in it since really early on. My first experience in video was very similar in timeline to those two Norelco cameras that are down at the Simpty booth uh, brought by the Museum of Broadcasting. And I used to push one of those around. Somebody said to me one time, well, Kevin, how long have you been using a mirrorless camera? And I'm going, well, since the 70s. And they didn't realize that mirrorless cameras have been around a really long time. And that's what all television cameras were slash are. And most of our video cameras are, actually all of them are, because we have a separate monitor from the sensor. So mirrorless cameras are not new by any stretch of the imagination. If you think about the four by five cameras, the ones where you put the cloth over your head that ultimately wears off all the hair off of your uh, skull, um, those were single lens, those were mirrorless cameras. There were no mirrors in them. So it's not a new thing. And how we do composition in 16 by 9 is really important because a lot of the stills now can be cropped to that. Composition. I like to know what I'm talking about, so I spend a lot of time with the Oxford English Dictionary, and I really like this uh, definition. The artistic arrangement of the parts of a picture, line, shape, and color. So those are the things that we're really involved in in doing composition, but there's more to it. So let's take a look at the elements of art, and we'll repeat the ones that we've just had in the definition. They're line, shape, and color. But there's more to it. And the more to it are the elements of design. And those are the things that make the picture really work. The rhythm, how, does it, uh, how do our eyes flow through a photograph or a scene? What are we looking at? The balance. Is it weighted to one side that forces us to look at one side? And if it does, does that tell the story? And variety. And then there's the big one. And this is the one that everybody, I think, misses until they've had a lot of years under their belt. And that is intuitive decisions. I am one of these people we, there are two of us here that are instructors. Angela calls her photographs. I don't throw anything away. Neither one of us is wrong. And I've found that as I go back and look at some of my old images, I see things that I didn't see when I first shot them and I thought I was seeing, well, crap. 
And I'm looking at them now and I'm with more sophisticated eyes. And I'm going, oh, there's actually a little teeny tiny bit of genius there. So these are things that I'm going to give you some examples of how, that, how I use that. All right. Painters add elements to their pictures. They start with a blank canvas and put stuff on it. And if they're really good, they make a lot of money after they die. True? Photographers, we take stuff away. Because when we're out making photographs, unless we're in the studio and we're composing a still life or an ad or something that we're actually designing, we have to take things away. I've spent a lot of time shooting architecture and doing buildings. And one of, when I was shooting film with a 4x5, you know, there'd be a telephone pole or something in the way, and we'd just take a chainsaw and move it out of the way. Well, no, not really, because then we'd get arrested. But I've spent a lot of time moving garbage cans and things like that out of scenes. Now I don't have to because I can do it digitally, and it's much more efficient. In camera, we've got aspect ratios. We've got center of the sensor syndrome, which drives me crazy. And I think that every beginning photographer, videographer does this. The rule of thirds, which I think is overdone, and it's got, it's got some value. So we'll spend a little bit of time on it. Leading lines. I'm not telling you anything you haven't already been exposed to. What I'm hoping is that all of this will be pulled together so that when you're out shooting, you're making photographs that really work for you and tell your stories. And this is one of my favorites. Where do I put the camera? Now, as I've gotten older, I'm finding it's harder to put the camera down low. Well, actually, it's not harder to put it down low. It's harder to get back up after I've done that. So I'm not doing that as much as I used to. And I'm in the gym working out with a coach three times a week to get stronger so I can. All right. And here is uh, my, my, be my second best advice. My first best didn't make the slide. My second best advice is shoot loose, crop later. My first best advice is use a tripod. Why would I tell you to use a tripod? Well, video people, you know why because you've got to eliminate that camera movement. Still folks are going, no, by gosh, I am rock solid. No, you're not. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go to the range with a rifle and see if you can put that bullet in the same place in the target every single time. You can't, because your heart beats and you breathe. So we're not rock solid. But a tripod helps eliminate a variable that's very important in composition, and that variable is the composition itself. If I set my camera on a tripod, particularly when I'm arranging a frame, I can take as many pictures as I want to. I can do HDR. I can bracket if I want to just because I'm not sure. But I can actually study the image and look, step back and look at it. In a DSLR, I can look through the viewfinder and see what I'm seeing. On our mirrorless cameras, how many people shoot mirrorless? All right, so we're all looking at the sensor, I mean the monitor on the back. Yeah, that's a nice camera. I've been admiring that this last couple of days. So we can study it. Do we? Not always. I shoot tethered. And that helps me an awful lot in my compositions because I can see it on a big screen and it takes me away from the camera for a moment. So these are things that help me be deliberate. And I'm suggesting that deliberate composition is better than run and gun. There are times for run and gun. Yep, sure are. And if we're going to do great videos, we're going to do great photographs, we need to be very deliberate. Now, a lot of people like camera movements in video. They like to see the camera move. My concept is that unless you're Steven Spielberg, put your camera on a tripod and make the image inside the frame move. He is a master of moving the camera. And it's getting better. But moving the camera, unless it supports a story, is not worth it and it's really expensive if you've looked at some of those devices they use. And we're going to talk about using light to direct the eye. Format. 
All right, this one is the one that uh, the still photographers are pretty much stuck with. And this goes back to about 1908. Edison had invented the movie camera and the film was, uh, the frame was 18 millimeters wide, or 24 millimeters wide and 18 millimeters tall and it ran vertically through the camera. Still does that today if you're shooting film. A gentleman by the name of Oscar Barnack decided he wanted a small portable film camera and he figured out that an 18 by 24 frame was, the film stock wasn't very good. It would be super grainy and they wouldn't be able to enlarge it very much. So he took the vertical film, turned it on its side, and now the frame is 24 millimeters tall and he doubled, he doubled the width to 36. So that's where we came up with inch, by, inch and a half by an inch aspect ratio, or this one. And this one I hate. I much prefer four by five or square, but this is what we do, and so <laughs> shoot loose, crop later. The next one is the original TV, which is four to three, micro four thirds. And this is what the old, this, those cameras that I was telling you about, that's the aspect ratio that they use. And you see it quite often in documentaries where they pulled old footage. This is what uh, 16 millimeter was. My favorite is square because I can crop it either way if I want to. Uh, film cameras that use this, Hasselblad, the camera that went to the moon and took the pictures of the astronauts on the surface. Roloflex, a lot of the uh, uh, photographers like Richard Avedon, Irving Penn used this format. And um, Mamiya made a really good one as well. So this was very popular in film. It's two and a quarter square. If anybody's ever seen the work of Vivian Meyer, the street photographer, she used square format Roloflexes. So this is a really good format and we don't have it today because with the exception of a very short period of time, Hasselblad made a square format back, but it wasn't the full two and a quarter square. It was really cropped and it never caught on. So we don't have a sensor that will do this today. Although with some of the higher megapixel cameras, it's pretty easy to uh, say, okay, I wanna shoot square and work that way. Then we've got good old video, high definition. This is a great format. It lets us do an awful lot in the composition because we've got so much room. Now, video shooters out there, how many of you shoot in 4K? Me too, why? You what? which means that you can crop, right? So that when that, that little irritating thing that you miss that's over there, you can just kind of, you know, scale it in a little bit, right? Okay, that's why we shoot high megapixel still cameras, because we can crop. And let's face it, a billboard, back when we were shooting billboards on film, my God, they wanted four by five or eight by 10. How many of you have seen Air, the new movie about uh, Air Jordan? Well, if you look, there's a photograph in there of a runner in the Nike's office, and he's doing this, and he's in sprinklers after the Peachtree Road Race. A friend of mine, Chuck Rogers, photographed that image, and he's made a huge amount of money from licensing from Nike. And you'll see it several times in the film. But that was shot on 35 millimeter, and it's been everywhere, including in billboards. But really good billboards you had to shoot in a higher quality format. Today, an electronic billboard is HD. It's 1920 by 1080. So what, we don't really need all the megapixels for that. All right, center of the center, what it says up there. Why? Why is that a problem? Well, what's in the center of all of our cameras when we first take them out of the box? Our iPhones are the same way. I don't know about Android, but it's, there's a little indicator where, you, where the focus point is, where it's gonna autofocus. So what do you do? You put the most important thing in the, on that and take the picture. So right in the center of the image, you're wasting a huge amount. And I don't like this. Now, new cameras like the Canon R6, the R5, they can do eyeball tracking and they do it really, really well. But if you're not used to using that kind of thing, we wanna make sure 
that our images are properly framed. It's okay to use the center of it. Back in the film days with SLR film cameras, we had a split image finder and we'd use that for focus and we'd reframe. Except if you're an amateur and then it, it's this. So it's been around a really long time. But if we move things up after it's focused, uh, the, the framing is much more dynamic and the picture works a whole lot better. And we do it with everything. There's the center of the frame. This is a boring picture. I mean, the big round building is right in the middle of the frame. And we're gonna talk a lot, and you're gonna see this quite a bit, because there's several different things you can do compositionally in the camera to make this a more interesting picture. Okay, it's a composition class, we've got to do this. Everybody knows the rules of third. Let's see if I can make it a little more fun. It starts by dividing the horizontal frame into thirds. And then you divide the vertical into thirds. And where they cross, those are called centers of focus, centers of interest, or the new term for it is PowerPoints. I'm sure that Microsoft is really delighted with that. So wherever they cross, that's where the most interesting part of the composition is technically. And let's take a look at some of the things that that means. So when we do this, all of a sudden, you know, nothing really holds the composition together. But if we back up a little bit, it starts working more. And you can see what I mean. So now we've got two thirds, almost two thirds of the image weighted on the left side and one third on the other side. So it's a, it's a more interesting composition and we're gonna come back to that. Now, I've been photographing this boat for a while. This was shot on Kodachrome, to give you an idea. And it wasn't because I was out shooting Kodachrome because they stopped developing it, I think in 2003 or f somewhere in there, maybe nine, anyway. This was shot while film was still a thing and Paul Simon was still happy because nobody had taken his film away from him. And this is uh, in the Bay of Nantucket. And I love the picture, I love the color, and it's boring. And, and the nice thing about this image is this white ball here proves that you've got to look at it because it's the brightest part of the picture, no matter where the boat is. So if we move it down here, it goes automatically to a PowerPoint, and it's a very effective composition. Not only is it bringing our eye to it because it's the brightest part of the picture, but it's also interesting and you're wondering where the boat's going and lots of other thoughts. Explore different compositions. You'll never get it right just by putting the tripod down and taking the picture. Move the tripod around. This is the same boat and this was shot with the R5 not that long ago. And you can see that it's really a lot rougher than it was but this thing's got to be 25 years old. And I don't know why they keep it anchored out there, but this is right on the harbor of Nantucket. And so by exploring different compositions, you get different feelings. And here, we're working with triangles. We've got the triangle shape of the boat itself to start with, and then we've got the paint bucket where the white ball used to be, offset by the two boys. So it's a more interesting composition. And by staying with the scene and spending time with it, you see things you didn't see otherwise. Here, the color carries the composition. You've got the contrasting colors of blue and red, and you have to look at the boat, so it puts it in the scene. Leading lines. Let's go back to Tampa, and here is a really great example. You've got the guardrail, the shadow of the guardrail, and the sidewalk all taking us right into the, into the photograph. And it's balanced reasonably well. Back here, we've got several leading lines. Again, the guardrail and the sidewalk. But we've also got this wonderful train trestle. And the line forces us to look over to the corner where we pick up the buildings, come across, and then we can come back along the sidewalk to the trestle. So it helps move the eye through the image. Uh, there are permanently marked tripod points 
on the Jackson Street Bridge in Atlanta where you can get this picture. Actually, there aren't, but everybody shoots Atlanta from there. I can't tell you how many times I've shot Atlanta from there. It's a great location. Um, anybody here drink Sweetwater beer? Ever heard of it? Okay, well, I won't tell you that story. Uh, so anyway, this is going into downtown Atlanta and really great example of leading lines. Camera position. Let's go back to Atlanta. This, I think, is a really powerful skyline shot. And very few people have it because this kind of thing requires access. This is shot from on top of that circular hotel you saw earlier, and it's looking north. And the reason I have this photograph that I shot it, this was done on film with a Fuji uh, two and a quarter by 17, uh, or well, six centimeter by 17 centimeter film format. So it's about like this, ultra wide. And I'm up on top of the Weston Peachtree Plaza shooting. It's December, it's about 40 mile an hour winds. There are no guardrails on the hotel. If you keep walking, you will fall down and die. Uh, anybody see Sharky's machine? No, okay. Remember the, hotel, the round hotel where the guy gets thrown out of the top window? That's where I'm at, only I'm two stories above where he went out. And I shot this because I was also photographing their, the interior of their rotating restaurant and they wanted to have a skyline. Well, the way the restaurant's set up is you can't see this when you're sitting at a table. The angle's wrong. In order to see this, you actually have to get up on a ladder and shoot through the windows, and the time exposure is horrible. Believe me, I had to do it once. We were doing 40-minute time exposures with people in it, hold still, and in order to get the picture. So I shot these, cut them together in a new piece of software called Photoshop. This was done in like 93. So it, it was really state of the art at the time. Position allows you to do things you wouldn't normally do. Look down, look up, look side to side, get down low, struggle to get back up if you're me. But, you know, find different angles. Now, I went to Paris for my 60th birthday. I'm 70 now, so it's been a while. And I gave myself the assignment of photographing the Eiffel Tower in a way that I'd never seen before. So I was wandering around. This is on the way to uh, Rodin's museum. And yeah, it's very interesting. I like that. Good leading lines. You see the cannons forcing you back to the Eiffel Tower. OK. Here's another one from Concord Place where they have it all torn up. Hooray. Um, again, probably I could have cropped on this side so you had the three columns and the woman looking at the Eiffel Tower. But I knew this wasn't the shot. I was having coffee in the Pompidou Center, and I'm going, oh, oh, I need to get up. I need to find a high location. So I was touring downtown, and the tour guide that I was with took us up on top of a department store, and there was the, there was the location. We were touring Napoleon's uh, opera, and I saw this and I'm going, I gotta come back. So I came back and here's the setup. Uh, this, yes, I went to Paris and I carried a big tripod. I am so glad I did because it let me get this picture. I fulfilled what I wanted to get. But there's an interesting story about this. So I'm up in this cafe and the attendant there, the manager came up, I asked him if I could take pictures and he said, sure but you got to leave by 7.30. I said, no problem, I'm happy to do that. And so I got the camera all set up and it was about 7.25 and he came up and he said, you know, you've got to leave at 7.30. And I said, yeah, I'm going to take the last series of pictures right at 7.30 and get out of your hair. And he says, uh, do you use Photoshop? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, you know what my ma favorite magazine is? And I said, no, I have not. How in the world would I know that? He said, well, it's Photoshop user. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, do you know what my favorite column in the magazine is? Well, I had an inkling, I was familiar with the magazine. He says, it's the digital photographer's notebook. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. I said, hi, I'm Kevin Ames, I write it. <laughs> oh, you can stay until eight o'clock. 
I mean, it was total serendipity. It was just one of those absolutely fortunate things. And the guy's name was Simon. I immediately got back to where I was staying, put together a picture, and sent it to him and said thank you because I had his email address. So, um, yeah. Shoot, lose, crop later. This is really important. When I'm doing, I do a lot of headshots, a lot of corporate headshots. And when we're going for profile pictures, it's really easy in Lightroom or uh, Camera Raw, which is my favorite, to uh, crop and really make a great shot. And you don't need to have a super high resolution camera. This is shot with a 1DX Mark III, I think, Mark II or III, 20 megapixel camera. That's plenty. But I shoot a little bit loose so I can crop. This was shot with a Kodak Nikon slash Kodak slash Nikon DCS 760, which was a, at the time I bought it, it was $8,000. Three months before I bought it, it was $28,000. And it was a whopping 6.1 megapixels. Woohoo! But it was a digital camera and it was portable and I took it to Africa. And it really, by shooting loose, it allows you to crop and get great pictures. 6.1 megapixels, that looks pretty good. And uh, just, in camera raw. And what's really cool about this, Adobe used DCR pictures, that's the file for that camera, as one of the basis for their raw processor in camera raw, Thomas Knoll. I don't know if you've heard the story, but that's, if we have time at the end, I'll, tell, I'll share. But every time they come up with a new process version for camera raw, these pictures get better. I cannot believe, do you, do you know how many pieces of film I have that I wish that were better now than when I shot them 40 years ago? This is so cool. Anyway, uh, this is another shot done with the uh, Kodak. It was a magazine editorial, but I had a need for it to be 16 by 9. And notice how it looks like film grain? That's good old digital noise from a 6.1 megapixel camera without trying to take any of it out because I really like the texture. Okay, fast forward. This is uh, one of the Canon, uh, like a 1DS 2 or 3. And I'm shooting a bicycle race in Athens, Georgia. And I'm shooting a little bit loose. This is not a bad picture, but I brought it in to do some cropping to tell the story better. So let's take a look at this. All of a sudden, the story becomes this guy that is pushing really hard to be the leader, except for one little thing. I left this in on purpose because he's striving to be almost as good as the guy that far ahead of him. But that's a way that cropping and shooting loose can really help you tell a story. Uh, this is in London on the underground. And Again, it's a matter of cropping. This is an interesting shot, but you'll notice that right up here, I have a laser pointer, but I like getting my finger in this. You know, that's kind of boring. There's too much white space over here. So just a little bit of cropping makes a much more powerful picture. Now there's another thing going on here. I went into camera raw and put a little more light on her face because I know that you're gonna look there because it's the brightest part of the image. Particularly when I crop the other bright things out, it really drives, the picture drives your eye. And I think that's important that we be able to crop. I wonder, we, the question came up at the end of your session about um, what photojournalists can do. Well, have you all seen the picture of the guy standing down the tank in Tiananmen Square. If you look, there's about 100 photographers behind him taking the picture, which is the real reason he didn't get run over. But they were all cropped out of the picture that went to press. And now I wonder, I'm looking at the New York Times coverage of the war in Ukraine, and I'm wondering, first of all, why is everything underexposed? And secondly, why aren't they cropping for power? I don't know if editorially they're not allowed to. All right, so with that in mind, you can't not look at the black dot, right? No matter where it goes, your eye's gonna follow. You, you don't have a choice, because that's the way we're wired. And if it becomes a white dot against a black background, guess what? Same thing, you're gonna follow it, oh yeah? Here we go, this is great. I'll follow you anywhere. 
And I use that, and we use that to tell a story. So Sigma hired me to photograph with their new 8 to 16, it was 8 new at the time, 8 to 16 millimeter uh, APC size uh, lens. And they wanted me to shoot it at eight, 8 millimeters, and they wanted it in a unique location. So I, I did some wrangling and got permission to shoot in the High Museum uh, in Atlanta, downtown, well not downtown, in midtown Atlanta. How many of you have seen Black Panther? Do you remember the, the British Museum of Science and History? That's, the, that's this with a different sign on it. And so here, I'm setting up the first light, and I want your attention to go to her face. But I also need you to see the gown. So I'm going to light for that, but notice her face is still brighter. So that's a tool that I'm using to bring the eye to the woman's face. Because in my mind, in any portrait, that's the most important and most interesting part. Do the same thing here. I put his face against a different color, and I balance it out. This is all done on purpose with the meal and the dark glass of wine, so that your eye has no choice but to travel around the image. It's all very deliberate. And again, the camera's on a tripod. I'm looking at it tethered on the laptop. I'm walking over and putting things in the shot. Same thing here, it's just a reverse principle. Dark dress against the light background. You can't not look at her. Now, how can we do some of this in post-production? Because frankly, our lighting tools aren't as precise as our digital tools. So here's a portrait, canvas background, you know, fairly large light, reflector underneath. Pretty straightforward. Taking it into camera raw and using the radial filter, there's another way to do this without using camera raw. And the camera raw filter will do this too. So you can either do it in the raw, which is where I prefer, or you can do it in Photoshop using the filter camera raw. And I draw a radial around her, then invert it. And that's what this, and I'm going to have to use the laser. Well, I don't think I will. Yeah, it's right here. You click that button, and it makes everything the opposite direction. So now, anything I adjust is going to happen in the red area. So I don't want to adjust her face. I want to adjust everything else. So I drop the exposure slider a little bit, and all of a sudden, I've got an absolutely perfect vignette. And what I love about this technique is this area that gets dark does not build in contrast. The way to do this in Photoshop is to draw the ellipse using the elliptical marquee tool, make a curves adjustment layer. It comes up with uh, a layer mask automatically. You invert the layer mask so it's black on the outside, white on the inside, set it at 50% and change the blending mode to multiply. And then there's a neat little slider called feather in the properties panel. And you drag that over to about 200, 250 and you get this effect, except the skin tones actually build in contrast, where you've darkened them. So which one works better for you? Meh? Yeah, yeah. That's why I put it there, because that's where your eye's going to end up. That's another part of composition, is that we are designed to look at the lower right-hand corner. That's where we end up when we're reading a page. So that's the action area for a print advertisement, or for that matter, anything you do digitally. You want it on the right side, because we go from left to right. It's different in Asia and other places. Uh, went to London, had a great time, and the hotel had really not so good, really expensive food, and I found this pub you know, less than a block away from the hotel. It's called The Goat. And my first day there, there were, there were these two old guys talking about life. You got Queen Victoria in the background. And I've broken a little bit of a compositional rule by putting type in here. But this guy blocked so much of it that you're really not able to read too much, so you're not going to spend time on it. And this works pretty well, but our eye tends to go up to Vicky there because it's the brightest part. So all I did was add a little tiny bit of light to this older guy's face, and now the picture's balanced. 
See the difference? It doesn't have to be a lot. But this is some, and this is what I did on the girl in the, in the underground. It's this kind of thing that makes our compositions really, really work. And to do this, we actually have to get some distance. How many people print their pictures? Have you noticed that when you make the print, and for the rest of you, I'm encouraging you to do that, you look at the picture more seriously? Oh, yeah. you, you look at the print and you're going, well, well, yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, my big one is, well, F, how in the world did I miss that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, again, uh, this is a scene in the garden of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And I, I love these concrete blocks and the woman sitting there. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. So I brightened her up just a tiny bit. And now you've got to look at her even more, right? So there's the difference. And it's, it's super simple. It takes about three minutes to do this. So these are the kind of compositions that you use in post that really help composition. So this is, this is not Big Ben. Big Ben is the clock. This is the Queen's Tower, named after Queen Elizabeth. And I shoot practically everything when I'm out wandering around in HDR. And I'll show you why. It basically says I've got a lot to choose from. I can make an HDR picture, which I'm going to do with this. Does everybody know what I mean by HDR? Anybody not familiar? Okay, you're, are you familiar with it? Am I? Yeah. yeah okay, I just, I just want to make sure because quite often people will be teaching a class and they'll assume everybody knows stuff and people don't know and that's not fair. So I've, I've got time built in. By the way, if you have questions, we've got time. Let's ask. Let's participate. So with the HDR, with these three, I'm not happy really with any of them. I wanted to see what I could do. And by manipulating some colors and tones, I got this. And I really like this a lot better. Now, I want to live with it for a while, print it, put it on the wall, decide, uh, no. Or, mm, yeah, that's not bad. Everybody photographs this building. And I thought it was an interesting position to have the London Eye in the background. Because it's a lot taller than the Queen's Tower. And here's a close-up of the hub of the London Eye. It's like the center of the big wheel over here by uh, the link. And I shot it in HDR. But I decided not to use it in HDR because I'm going, okay, this has got some graphic possibilities. And graphics and design are also part of composition. So I went into Camera Raw and just did a minor amount of work. You can see the settings over there. And I think this picture works. Your eye goes right to the hub and you've got all of these leading lines forcing you back into it. And I like it. And when you come right down to it, unless you're, unless you're getting paid by somebody else, that's the determining factor on whether or not it's a good picture. If somebody else is paying you, it's their determination. But if we're doing it for ourselves, you say, I like it, you're right where you want to be. OK. Have I mentioned that I'm not a big fan of the, four, uh, the three to two uh, ratio? I'm not. And this is the reason. I'm photographing Amy in my old studio at a big psych wall and she's jumping with his red dress. I love this picture. I said, it's so good, except I cut off the edges. And I'm really peeved about that. But do you remember that I said I never throw anything away? Well, this is not the first pic, this is not the only picture in the set. So I went into Photoshop, made the canvas size bigger, and then I started going through different looks until I found something that might possibly fill in the edges of the dress. And there's another one. And uh, I isolated them, brought them together. Oh, that's just a perfect match. How wonderful. Put the black in. Put the, I'm sorry, white in the background. Now, I don't know about you. Red dress and non-painted toenails don't work for me. But Photoshop allows me to do digital manicures. 
And uh, once you draw the paths for all of this, you can change them to any color you want. And so there's the finished photograph that I had in my head, but I wasn't able to do it because of the limitation of the camera. I didn't see it when I was shooting it until I got into post. But by saving everything, I had all the parts and pieces I needed, and I like the picture. She likes it for her portfolio, so all good. This is a commercial job. This guy is a part-time CFO that you can hire on an hourly basis. And he wanted people to know that he wasn't just a stuffy financial guy. So he came, you know, he's got the, the ratty Converse shoes and the jacket and all of this. And okay, fine, Chris, that's great. And when it got time to crop it, we realized for an eight by 10, I'm back to the problem with the two by three format. I don't have enough room. Fortunately, Adobe crawls inside my head and says, Kevin, we feel your pain and we're gonna fix it just for you. Well, maybe not, but. So I expand the canvas size and then there's a tool called Content Aware Fill. This thing is so awesome and it's getting awesomer and awesomer as they, I, I know it's not a word, but it ought to be as they get AI into it. So you tell it you wanna fill those places and it says, okay, the green, air, green areas are the ones we're gonna use. And I'm going, okay, that should look pretty, wet, pretty good. That's a preview that it generates and I say, wow, yeah, that's gonna work just fine. So we do it and it comes up on a layer like that. And if I wanna do it again, I can. But one of the things I noticed is content aware duplicated this right here. The human eye loves patterns. We are drawn to them. You know, think flies and honey, you know, think, well, no, let's not. But we, we see those and I'm looking at it, I'm going, oh, no. But fortunately, the healing brush takes care of that too. So it's, it's really easy. Th this did not take long. And so now he's got the eight by 10 format he wants, four by five, 16 by 20, all the same ratio. And there's the finished image. Okay, now we've all heard about sky replacement. We've been doing this a really long time before it became an automated thing. And I'm not opposed to it. And it doesn't work as well as the good old pen tool. So this is kind of a throwback version. This house is on Nantucket. Uh, on Madigat Beach, and Madigat is eroding. It's, this is, there's not that much land back there now. This is Mr. Rogers' old house on Nantucket. It's called the Crooked House, and as you can see, it kind of, it is kind of crooked. And I didn't like the uh, sun, so I was out shooting other areas on uh, Nantucket. This is just by the airport at the end of the beach. And uh, here's another one looking back the opposite directions. Planes actually fly over this as they're coming in for landing. And I don't remember, ex I think I was up on Alter Rock or someplace like this, photographed the birds, said, oh, that's a nice guy. So I went into Photoshop, cut a path using the pen tool. How many people here use the pen tool? Okay, congratulations. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm really pleased to see most people use it. It's truly the most powerful selection tool in Photoshop. If you find yourself using something else, you're going to wind up spending more time trying to get the selection right than if you do it with a path in the first place. So with that selection made, I can change the skies. So this sky is actually pretty accurate as far as the lighting of the day. Heavy overcast, the sun is punching through a little bit. So there's that bright spot right up there. This one works pretty well too. The blue complements the color of the shingles. And of course, this one is the one that you gotta use because the birds are there. And everybody says, well, you put them there. And I said, no, they were flying just like that. So these are, the, and by the way, with the pen tool, I even put in this guy wire. So these are the kinds of things in compositions. Don't be afraid to try different things. You don't know what you're gonna love until you do these things. Okay, now here's a commercial use for this. Uh, this happens to be an insurance company in Atlanta. They do uh, property and casualty, and they're an independent agency. That means that they can shop different companies for what you want. And this is their team of specialists with the owner in the, in the center. But 
they know they're going to have turnover and they know they're going to add people. So I shot a whole bunch of pictures of everybody in different positions so I could composite them together later to make that picture. There's a trick. First of all, the camera is locked down at a specific height. And I make a note of that height because I'll obviously have to use it again. Then I take a picture of someone straight on and then on each side and I do several poses. Here's why. If you look at my hand and I move it over here, you're seeing a different shape on my palm than if I go over here than from here. A lot of people shoot these shots all straight on and they composite them and it looks weird because people on the edges are standing forward and there's no perspective. So you've got to, you've got to understand how photography works in order to make this work. So these, this is just one screen of, of the specialists that I photographed and we'll just pick on, uh, on Marielle here. And so I shoot her in the center, a couple of different poses. I like this pose, and if you're, in, if you're going to NAB, you'll see a lot of broadcasters, and they're here or they're holding the microphone. That's because if they crop into the 16 by nine, they cut their hands off. So we want those hands up. And so I make sure that I shoot it a myriad of different ways, and it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, here's Matt, and uh, cut him out. Just use Photoshop to drop these out. Same thing with Muriel. And then I make the canvas size really wide and I start dropping people in. I brought in the principal, put him slightly in front of Muriel and then Jill. And anyway, get the idea, I know these people. And fill in the gaps. And these are actually the sizes they'd be. So if you're building the, if you're building the group shot individually, this is how you'd build it if they were all there live. And of course, there's a missing picture because on the day of the shoot, one of the vice presidents had to go down and take care of his mother in Florida. So we arranged for him to come into my studio in my house, and I photographed his image separately and put him in. Well, this becomes very powerful because if somebody leaves, I can reshuffle the, the deck. And the nice part about it, since I have so many different versions of everybody, I can make the picture look completely different. Also, when they add somebody, and one of the people here, I don't know the circumstances, but I have a hunch it wasn't voluntary, left. And I found out that particular person had left. So I removed them from this picture and put it back together. And I got a letter back, for, or an email back from the owner, the guy in the center, Michael. And he said, I didn't realize how valuable what you've done for us is. Now when we add staff, this is gonna save us so much money. And I've done several of these kinds of compositions. Now, I love to play. I, I spend a lot of time in Photoshop playing. This is Corinne Allen. She used to work for Channel 46 as uh, a host of like, I think it was Good Day Atlanta. And I was photographing her for a magazine. And I shot this image and I really liked it. And I thought, I can put that together with something. This is done in, uh, I, I was doing, a, a friend of mine that lived in San Francisco did what she called the nickel tour. You give her a nickel and she'd drive you around all these places in San Francisco, late afternoon and in the evening. And I know she spent a hell of a lot more than a nickel, but it was a great time. This is one of the pictures I took out of the window. And this is a sunset uh, in Dallas, Texas that I photographed. And I like photographing smoke, so I made a bunch of pictures of smoke. And I thought, these are really interesting patterns, and I can do something kind of interesting with them. This is nothing more than using free transform and different layers, stepping and repeating. And so I cut half of Corinne's face and flopped it, I used the skinny side, because there's a heavy side and a thin side to practically every face, except for the ones classified as supermodels. Those people have uh, symmetrical faces, about 1% of the population. So I did this, put it together, and then changed some backgrounds. Now, there's a trick when you do the flip. You've also got to take this catch light and copy it over here, because otherwise the catch light will be flipped, 
and people will, that, that's a dead giveaway of what you did. This is pretty obvious, but if the catch lights are right, you sit there and go, wait a minute, it makes sense. And here's another one. And seriously, this is an easy afternoon's play. It's a lot of fun. I went to the Philippines to teach them classes, and one of the things they wanted me to do was do a live studio shoot in front of the audience, which I did. And this is a picture that I got from it. This girl's name is Aria. And I love the makeup that their makeup artist did. The, uh, they're, they're wonderful. So I did the same thing with her face. So if you take a look, this is the thin side. I think it's this side is the one that I duplicated. Yeah. So I just flipped it. And I did have one picture of her eyes closed. And I love those. I thought, wow, this is going to be perfect. I mean, it, we're making art. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be real. So all of a sudden, we've got kind of an alien thing working here. Have you ever wondered how come the aliens look so weird? It's because aliens in the movies are symmetrical. And it, it's really scary. So I brought in some of the smoke, made a crown, and kept layering and having fun. And I got to, I got to go to Corregidor, which is one of the, it's the barrier island that, that guards Manila Bay. And that's where a big battle in World War II started right after Pearl Harbor. And I, t I was up really super early and did some sunrises. So that's what you see there. And uh, one of my clients loved it and used it for uh, an advertisement for their lighting equipment. OK. So I guess you kind of see what this is all about. And that is the show. And we're a little bit early. So I do have time for questions if you have any. No, I actually shot the smoke separately. And I used Camera Raw to really get, I'm a big fan of Camera Raw. I've been using it since it was first introduced. And I'm massively in love with it. And I'm more in love with it now with the masking tools. But those, those, were, those pictures, I've got hundreds of pictures. You can get, I, I think I burned three sticks of incense and I got like 700 pictures. And so I just shot a lot, shot it loose. So I got everything in there. And it's, it's a one light setup. It's really easy to do. So then I just went through and said, OK, this one will work. This one will work. And it's a matter of play. And one of the things that's really important about composition is playing. Exploring in the camera, sure. But how do I really want to portray that Las Vegas Ferris wheel? What's the best angle? How am I going to do that? Well, I'm not, because I, I'm really not that interested in it. I've shot some pictures of it. But when, it, when I come back here, and I, I get to come fairly often, I'll pick something and play with it and see how I see it differently with some time in between. So same thing in Photoshop. I can use any kind of picture that I want. One of my favorite things to do is dry, and don't tell any of the police, but I take my camera and set it in the dashboard with, um, set at f16 or f22, really low ISO, and a 30 second time exposure, and I'm driving around getting light streaks. I do that when the plane is landing. I'm sitting on the window, and, and the, the light streaks, you get lights like coming into Las Vegas as they're flying over it before they make the turn to come across Hoover. Oh, amazing. It looks like cancer cells. So I, I'm constantly shooting things like that. I don't know where I'm going to use them, but I've got them. And I never throw anything away. So it's a matter of scale. And again, one of the things I talked about was locking down the variables. All of these are shot with the camera locked absolutely down. It's 24 millimeter lens on the R5. So I've got a 50, well, 48 megapixel image. So I can, I can crop as I need. But I, I take one picture, one series of pictures dead on, then I move them all the way to the right of the background paper. OK, the right of the background paper. Well, as you're looking at it, that's correct. Uh, I'm directionally dyslexic, so there it is. And then I go to the other side and take a series of pictures. I don't move the camera. I don't change the scale because they're the, the size they are. And I use a very clever technique to keep them in the exact plane, same place on the background paper. I put a quarter there, and I said, go stand on the quarter, or put the quarter at the front of your toes. 
and that's how I keep everybody in, in size. As soon as you start transforming sizes, you're in trouble because everything else changes too and it looks weird. But these don't look weird because it's done the way they would be done if they were in a group. Yeah, let's go back to that because that, that really shows. Now that's a nine foot wide backdrop. I can only use an 84 inch in my studio because it's just the building, it just isn't wide enough. It's in the basement of a townhouse, but it's enough. And if I get them off the edge a little bit, I can outline around it if I have to. It costs 25 cents to solve that. Just drop the quarter on the piece of paper and you're ready to go. And you know what's really interesting? It takes about a half a second to take it out with a spot healing brush. If you're not gonna, I mean, if you're not gonna cut their feet off. Process. Well, my process is the three, two, one backup. Working drive, backup drive, offsite drive. Now I've just had the, the real pleasure, I'm a, I am a former Drobo Pro ambassador. And the reason I'm saying former is because I was using Drobos. Anybody in here use Drobos? Yeah. Um, they went bankrupt. The company that bought them out of bankruptcy shut them down. So if you've got Drobos, it's time to move. So I just invested in a whole bunch of other desktop attached storage systems and migrated everything. So I have a working drive that has all of my raw files on it and all of my working files, which are derivatives. And the reason I do it that way, rather than having them all together, is because I've been doing this a really long time. And before we got big hard drives, and, and we had other storage units, I was storing everything to start with on CDs, and then on DVDs, four gigabytes. So all of my archives were laid out in four gigabyte folders. They don't have to be now, but I serial number everything. So right now I'm shooting here and it's like 4,090 something. And I'm taking those pictures with that, those four digits in the front. And then whatever the image number is that comes out of the camera in the back, I rename them in, in bridge. And then if I take one of those to do a derivative image, um, it has that number. So let's see if these are individual images and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So if I click on that, that's a group. Let's just go to a picture. Let's go to this one. Here we go. So if I come up here to format, oh, I've got to click this first, and choose image. Oh, it's a screenshot, so that won't work. Um, it would have the actual working number on it. And so I know exactly where to find the working files and the original raw files. And if you want to go more in depth with that, my information is on this last slide, and I'm happy to chat with you. Uh, my contact information is on the website, kevinamesphotography.com.